Father, I thank you tonight for your word, for it's just an amen. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that's moving in this our midst tonight. I also thank you for angelic host who's moving in our midst. And Father God, I thank you that you are completing the works that you have begun. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading an article this morning, earlier this morning, and you know, um, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and killed all those people. Or the article I was reading, well, no, as somebody said to the guy who was running the Japanese army, said, what do you think they're going to do? And he said, I think you made the biggest mistake you could ever make because you just woke a sleeping giant. Now, I read another article, or the article I read this morning was about four years later, America went over there and bombed Japan and killed 100,000 people in one day. And they wanted everybody to feel sorry for Japan, the Japanese people because the Americans were so heartless to do this thing. But yet, Japan thought it was all right for them to go over there to Pearl Harbor and kill our people, you know, the Americans. Now, all that's going through my head, and we were singing that one song, the second to the last song, and um, I'm going to ask you a question. Hasn't Satan done enough to you that he's woke the sleeping giant inside of you? Well, you're going to do like America did and said enough is enough. And make the enemy pay for what he's stolen in your life. See that? I think it's time that we quit allowing the enemy to keep stealing and stealing and stealing. And I think it's time that we stand up on our two feet and we declare the enemy enough is enough. I'm having a lot of trouble with my printer again. <laughs> Brand new printer. So I looked at it and I said, you know, if I had a club, I'd beat you to death. <laughs> I threatened that printer. And I got, I fooled with it and finally it turned it off and on. I put black ink in it and finally it printed. I think I scared it. <laughs> I said, it then, but then I wouldn't use a printer after that. I said, no, nope, I got my message. That's all I'm worried about right now. But, you know, I really think we need to do that with the devil. Devil, I'm sick and tired of what you're doing. And then not only threaten him, but if I didn't, if it wouldn't be a brand new printer, I think I would have smashed it with something. <laughs> but, you know, we just really need to make the enemy stop stop what he's doing and make him you you're the only one who can do that you, you god told me he's a daughter you're the only one who can do this but then he told me how to do it you know a situation i'm praying about and he showed me how to do it so you know you're the only one who can do it but if, whenever you're really serious about it god will intervene whenever you're just ranting and raving he'll tell you exactly what to do about the situation but then you have to carry it through too once he reveals to you what it is you're supposed to be doing Play that, uh, put that scripture up there, will you, Nancy? Uh, we're going to read 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 and 2. David's title, it's entitled David's 400 Men. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, to the cave, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to David. So David became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now, I read that to say this. God spoke to me and told me when we first opened a church that we would have a swinging door church. And then he told me, like David, this is the type of people he would send my way. All right? So if somebody says you, well, <laughs> what kind of people do you have at the Lighthouse Church? You say, just repeat David in chapter two, uh, verse 2. This is a type, you see, and God said to me, I'm going to send you people that nobody else will deal with. And do you know, do you know 
Do you know how many people wouldn't deal with what I deal with in the people he sends? Because after all, that's beneath them. But Jesus dealt with them. Somebody has to deal with them. You know, the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the alcoholics that we deal with. You know, somebody has to deal with these people. But do you know, do you understand there's a lot of ministers in this area and other places who won't deal with these type of people? And they look down their nose at you if you do deal with these type of people. So you can't be thin-skinned, and you have to know what God has called us to do here in this church. And we have to hold our heads high and say, God's in control. And just praise and thank God that he is in control, and he is helping the people he sends. Somebody said to me this afternoon as I was leaving, they were standing there getting ready to use their cell phone, and I said, you have a good afternoon. And they said, you too, Pastor. And by the way, Pastor, I now know what my calling in life is all about. And I know what God wants me to do. I said, that's wonderful. And I went to get in my car and he said, Pastor, it's all because of you that I now know what my purpose in my walk with God is all about. It's not because of me per se. It's because of God and our obedience to minister to the people that nobody else will minister to. A lot of people come in here for a prophetic word and they find out what they're supposed to be doing and they find out how much God loves them and then that's a breaking point for them to go forth and accomplish what God has called them forth to accomplish. Our church is, God told me I'm going to send ministers in there to the church and you're going to minister to them you know teach them and then i you know god is going to send them forth to do their ministry and that's exactly what god has been doing now these men these people that god has been sending in and he's been teaching them now is a dispensation of time that they're going to be thrust forth to fulfill the ministry that they're supposed to fulfill now that young man said on the video this morning that this is a four-year period so I thought, wow, we have a lot to do in four years. Now, after these four years are up, I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And so you have to understand one thing. If you're here, you're here where God wants you to be because he's teaching you what you need to be taught to go forth and minister the gospel. All right? And I, we always do everything is lined up with a word. But God also, he, our church isn't like other churches, but then God's always saying that church is not going to be church as usual, that he's going to change the way churches function. And so we definitely are not a church as usual. And um, we do function whatever way God wants us to function. You know, like you're in here ministering and, I walk out there to do something, you know, for the church. I had to take care of something. And, and then another minister was sitting here, and they followed me out. And really, and then I had to deal, I had to tell Christopher to do something. And then he says, well, this pastor wants to talk to you. And he started telling me about something that was going on in his insides. And I immediately heard, this is witchcraft. So I let him go ahead and tell everything he wanted to tell me. Then I said, now, we're going to do a deliverance, and we're going to get this thing out of you. And so then I called, well, Christopher's there, and then I called Adam, and it, it left, right? What did the man tell you, Christopher? We, had, we anointed him with oil, and as soon as we anointed him with oil, he said he started feeling something on his inside, shake, and then we broke witchcraft off of him and commanded the witchcraft spirit and the soul fragment of a warlock and a witch to get out of him. And then as we did that, it left him. But he started shaking, and as he started shaking, he um bent over and then sat down on the couch. And he says he's never felt anything like that before. Now I said this, did that to say this. This was a pastor who came, who's been coming to be taught. He he does have a ministry, but yet he didn't know he had a spirit. And nobody else knew he had a spirit. There's other pastors with him. 
but God revealed to me as he was talking it was a spirit and so and God said get it out and so I immediately called the 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 ministers in there that do deliverance to minister to the man and I, I said there you go they're going to fix you and I shut the door and so and he was set free this if you're going to work for God you're going to have to have a deliverance ministry to start you're just going to have to have a deliverance ministry. And I know there's churches around here that think that we're of the devil because we have a deliverance ministry. But that was the first thing Jesus did was start casting out devils. So if you're ashamed and you don't want to be known as one that cast out devils, then God can't use you. Are you listening here? And see, so you guys that do deliverance, you should be so in tune to what, to what God is saying. I don't care what you're doing in here working. You should be in tune to God. You should be so close to God. He can speak to you anytime and tell you there's a spirit that he wants out then. Or he can tell you that there's a spirit and it's going to be hard and to do it later, but set them up for deliverance. And I do that too. When God tells me, don't do it here now, because it's going to take some time, set them up for later on. So, you, so I don't want you to say, no, there's a devil, we got to get it out. No, we only get it out if that's what God said. But then on the other hand, too, you have to understand that God said he's going to be coming in, using deliverance ministers to suddenly set the people free more than, more than, one, at, more than one at one time. And so you have to be ready with the anointing high in you for God to call upon you to use you to set these people free. All right. So tonight we're going to teach on, God told me for the month of March, he wants me to teach on forgiveness. So I titled this Forgiveness, Forgive or Forget It. Now, a young man was on an airplane thinking about a friend of his who had treated him wrongly in a financial deal they had. And he thought, I sure hope the Lord brings that whole thing up when so-and-so stands before him on the day of judgment. He, and this man said, immediately the Lord broke into his thoughts and said to him, I will be glad to bring it up as long as you don't mind me bringing up all the stupid things you have done. There isn't one of us sitting here today that we haven't thought just like this man thought. Now, the young man said he broke out in laughter thinking, I have never really forgiven him at all. Even with all my spiritualizing about the judgment seat, what I was really saying in my heart was, he will get his. With one sentence, the Holy Spirit showed me gross unforgiveness in my heart. Not only toward this brother, but toward many others who had hurt or offended me. Now there's some sitting in here that this, tonight that you, this is you. And all you can think of is, they're going to get theirs one day. <laughs> And see, that's not a forgiving heart. Matthew 6.15 says, Jesus said, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And Matthew 18.23 says, there, Jesus speaking, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. This man owed the king a whole lot of money. Ten thousand talents worth ten thousand talents was worth more than ten million dollars today. When he begged for patience, the king released him and forgave him the debt. The most beautiful part of this story is the fact that the king forgave him the debt, even though the slave promised to repay him. It was obviously an impossible amount of debt to ever work off in one's lifetime. And let's look at what this forgive, that forgiven servant did. But that servant, the one who was forgiven, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 
And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Can you imagine the nerve? You have just been forgiven $10 million, and instead of going out and celebrating, you go and find some poor Joe who owes you 18 bucks. He probably heard about your good fortune through the grapevine and thinks you're going to invite him to the party. When all of a sudden, you start strangling the daylights out of him. And when he asks you to be patient and give him a few days to repay you, you refuse and throw him in jail. Don't be one of these. Matthew 18.31 says, So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, you know, somebody that knew the man had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So the guy was forgiven, but because he wouldn't forgive somebody that owed him something, the first guy forgave him said, okay, now you're going to pay me all. You're going to be thrown in jail until you can pay me everything. Verse 35 again, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Jesus certainly couldn't have made himself any clearer about how upset our Father in heaven gets when after forgiving us for an eternal debt of sin, we hold some little five-and-dime grudge against someone else for whom Christ died. I see that over and over and over again in the body of Christ. God forgives you of your deep, gross sin, but you won't turn around and forgive somebody else because they wounded you or hurt you or sinned against you. God does not like that. I think it is also important to note that the debt the king had originally called off was now on again and in full. This has many theological implications, but I would say to you all today, whoever has ears, let him hear. God's been telling us, whoever has ears, let him hear. And this is what God is saying to each one of us in here tonight. I don't care if God forgave you just because you bumped into somebody. And then that somebody turns around and does you a gross wrong. You still have to forgive them. The word says so. If you have anything against your brother, at any rate, all this goes to warn us that if we have anything in our hearts against anyone, we should go to that person quickly and get the whole thing totally cleared up. It might be our parents or an employer, a teacher, or even a husband or wife. But in the light of this parable, we can see that however much anyone has hurt us, it doesn't even compare to the free gift of God's pardon for our sins. I want each one of you to get this ingrained in your spirit. I don't care what anybody has done to you. It does not allow you to hold unforgiveness, bitterness, or hate in your heart. It just does not allow you to do that. We must not put that forgiveness in danger of being made void by our refusal to go and do likewise. I said... We can see that however much anyone has hurt us, it doesn't even compare to the free gift of God's pardon for our sins. We must not put that forgiveness in danger of being made void by our refusal to go and do likewise. For the word of God says in the Romans twelve eighteen, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. If it is possible. 
2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. A root of bitterness. Bitterness is a deadly thing. In Hebrews 12.15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. According to this scripture, bitterness can not only hurt you, but it can spread like gangrene to others. And when you trace the life histories of men like Adolf Hitler, for example, you find that the great evils they engaged in later in life had their roots in, roots in deep-seated hurts from early in their childhood. This is one reason why you have to get a de- should get a deliverance to get rid of anything that happened to you early on in your childhood that keeps the door up for the enemy to keep coming in and and causing more pain and more hurt. And the next thing you know, you have a hardened heart and you're an unforgiving person. All right, the mass murders of the Charles Manson family stem from Manson's bitterness toward a record producer who didn't like his music. Outraged, Manson sent his family to the producer's home, not knowing that he had moved, and told them to kill anyone they found there. The appalling result was that all of the victims ended up to be people who Manson had never met, even met, showing that when bitterness runs unchecked in our hearts, it can spill over into other people's lives, and by it many be defiled. These people lost their life for no reason whatsoever except some man had bitterness in his heart. Why do you think all the murders and everything take place? If you really talk to her, somebody has murdered somebody, you'll always find out that in their childhood something terrible happened to them and they became bitter and carried it through their life and started making other people pay for what happened to them. Cults can even develop when the leaders get bitter towards the mainline churches or denominations. The life stories of such men as Joseph Smith, Moses David, children of God, was his title, John Todd and Jim Jones all have one thing in common, their hatred for hypocrisy in the church. But when their hatred turned to self-righteousness and intense resentment, It ruined the faith of many others, destroying whole families and even lives. See, if you get hurt by somebody you trust and and you leave it in your heart unchecked, you get bitter and you want to have revenge. And the next thing you know, you start blaming everybody. You think everybody's out to get you. And the next thing you know, it it becomes a total mess. And and your, your thoughts just go on a rampage. And you just think everybody around you is trying to do you in. Everybody knows when they get to that point. And what you need to do is cry out for help. Everybody needs to cry out for help. Romans one twenty one says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You're talking about these uh, the, the, the cult churches. You need to be very careful if you decide, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've been in, hurt in more than one church, you, ne- you need to be careful that whenever you leave those churches that you don't say, well, I'll start a church and I'll run it properly. You're already opened to the enemy of deception and you'll become a cult and you'll do dumb things like these other leaders did. And pull many away from God. Here's a little story. One day, now listen to this story carefully. One day, two monks were walking through their countryside. They were on their way to another village to help bring in the crops. As they walked, they spied an old woman sitting at the edge of a river. She was upset because there was no bridge and she could not get across on her own. The first monk kindly offered, we will carry you across if you would like. Thank you, 
she said gratefully, accepting their help. So the two men joined hands, lifted her between them, and carried her across the river. When they got to the other side, they set her down, and she went on her way. After they had walked another mile or so, the second monk began to complain. Look at my clothes, he said. Are you all going to fall asleep on me? I see your eyes going shut, and I know you're not in the spirit. If you need to get up and walk around, do, because you need to know about this, un- this forgiveness, all right? So after they had walked another mile or so, the second monk began to complain. Look at my clothes, he said. They are filthy from carrying that woman across the river, and my back still hurts from lifting her. I can feel it getting stiff. The first monk just smiled and nodded his head. This applies to the people in the church. Oh, I'll help you, I'll help you, but the minute you help them, then all of a sudden the devil gets in there and starts saying, why did you help them? You know, blah, 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 it goes on and on. And next thing you do, you're com- you're complaining because you did a good deed. All right. Now, a few more miles up the road, the second monk griped again. My back is hurting me so badly, and it's all because we had to carry that silly woman across the river. I cannot go any further because of the pain. The first monk looked down at his partner, now lying, lying on the ground, moaning. Have you cons-, And he said to the monk, have you, considered, have you wondered why I am not complaining? He asked. Your back hurts because you are still carrying the woman. But I set her down five miles ago. Doesn't that hit home? Isn't that where the body of Christ is at? Come on. First monk was wise. He put the woman, he carried her, did it, and he forgot about it. So he totally forgot about it. But the second monk, he couldn't forget about the fact that he had to do a good deed to somebody. That is what many of us are like in dealing with our past hurts and unforgiveness. We are that second monk who cannot let go of our hurts and cannot forgive. Where are you at your walk of forgiveness tonight? Many of us in here are that second monk. You are still carrying around your hurts. You're still carrying around the bitterness. You're ca- still carrying around the fact that, all right, so you have a ty- talent and uh, the people in the church don't recognize it or they do recognize it and they don't want to use it. So I'm just going to get good and angry and I'm going to talk about it all the time. I'm going to sit at my table and I'm going to think about it. When I go to work, I'm going to think about it. I'm just going to think about how bad everybody's hurt me. And I'm not going to let go of it after I have a right. Remember the story I told you one time I was in a church and I was only in a church a week and the pastor made me a deaconess and made me the Sunday school teacher. Well, somebody in the church wanted both positions before I got there as a small church and she wasn't happy about the fact that I had those positions and everybody in the church loved me. So she went to the pastor and told a bunch of lies about me. And so then the pastor member made this sermon up all about me. And at the end, he's, and he called me a Jezebel and everything. And I said, God, what is his problem? And he said, he's talking about you. Listen carefully to what he's saying. And then I looked, and his wife was sitting in front of me in the pew, and she was on her knees with her Bible. You know, she was casting out the Jezebel. And so the the pastor got all finished. He said, and it's you. And he pointed me, he said, you leave my church and never come back. And everybody jumped up and ran out except me and my husband and my grand and Jimmy and Gabriel. That was Jimmy. And um, he said, I told you, leave us. I'm not going anywhere. Not right now, anyhow. You're going to hear the truth. You stood up and made a fool of yourself over a lie of something in your church is jealous and envious and full of bitterness and hatred. They come and told you a lie, and why you believed it, I don't know. I said, but you saw all your people left your church. I don't know if you're going to get them back again or not. And I says, I really feel sorry for you, and I shook their hands. And I said to his wife, I feel sorry for you, too, that you chose to sit in front of me and do all that. And try to. I said, it didn't embarrass me, because I did nothing wrong. That man, his people never returned back to his church again. 
or because of one woman full of bitterness and anger. And he couldn't see it. I said, I came into your church, and you're the one who put me in these positions, and all I did was help you. I didn't try to take anything from you. I just helped, tried to help your church grow. He went to California, and I found out he was going to go, and God told me to tell him, tell him don't go, because it's not going to work out there. But they sold everything they had. They went to California. Next thing I knew, they were back. He said, when I got out there, everything they promised me wasn't there. So now I have nothing. So what they did then was opened up a home church, which was a good, it was good. It really was. Because he was a good preacher. But once he did what he did, the people didn't trust him. And that's what that was all about. They, they, didn't, they figured, well, if he would do that to me, who I wasn't very old in the church, they would do this. he would do the same thing to them if he got a chance. His wife died of cancer, and he eventually died too. But it's a shame that one woman can destroy a whole church. It happens all the time. Something happened to her that she could not forgive the people. I don't know what it was. I really didn't care, and I still don't. It was none of my business. But she could not forgive those people. Oh, here's what I wanted to get at. So I went home, and uh, somebody heard about it, and they could come to my house and said, aren't you upset? I said, no, I'm not upset. You have a right to be upset. No, I, I'm not upset. I didn't do anything wrong. And the person stayed a while kept telling me, you really need to be upset about this. So after they left, I got to thinking about it. I do have a right to be upset. After all, he embarrassed me. And after all, he didn't, that was all a lie. And after all, he shouldn't have done that. So, And the Lord said to me, don't you dare go there. Don't you dare go there saying you have a right to be upset because you don't. And I said to God, well, I have a right to be bitter if I want to. He said, go ahead. All right, you want you want bitter? Go ahead. For one year, I paid a terrible price for that. Learned a lesson a really bad way. We don't have a right to be upset because somebody hurt us in the house of God or in our home or at our workplace. We don't have a right to be upset. We are children of God. And what we have a right to do is to show Christ in every situation in our life. You're always going to be hurt in the body of Christ. I've told you that before, and I'll tell you that to the day Jesus takes me on home. Because the body of Christ doesn't know how to love. There's so much jealousy and envy and strife in the house of God. And this is what God is trying to get us to do, is to be, just like the man said this morning, the, the church is supposed to be a hospital. Oh, it was on that song, wasn't it? Yeah, the church is supposed to be a hospital, but it isn't. When one of your brothers or sisters are down, you're not supposed to kick them. You're supposed to pray for them, lift them up. And when God told me about a, a brother in, in the Lord, I immediately went to prayer. I immediately did what I know to do so he could receive the miracle that he needs. It doesn't matter if people have hurt me. They hurt Jesus too. Our job is not to be like them. Our job is to be an example of Jesus and we need to help when we know that we can help. So just where are you at right now? What if somebody from a glow and did something really bad to you? Would you be able to forgive them and go on? Or would you sit at home and stew about it and complain about it and lose your salvation over it and lose your position in a glow? See, we have to think of these things. The devil will send anybody he can your way to destroy you. What if God sent a, a praise and worship leader in who was already in the praise and worship for years and God said I want to use him instead of you how would you feel about that and don't tell me right this second you would feel great because you wouldn't I want you to think about that all right I really want you to think what would I do in that situation would I act like Jesus or would I be like the devil and carry on like a fool before I got my life straight Every one of us in here, we have to stop and think. 
And, you know, like my kids, Gabriel's always asking me questions. He said, what would you do, my mom? I said, I don't know. I'm not in that situation yet. I don't know what I would do until I'm in the situation. Now, you might get upset for a little bit, and I mean a little bit, five-minute bit. <laughs> but then I think after five minutes, you need to give it to God and cry, just like I did about I was telling you about this morning. I had to keep giving it to God and giving it to God and giving it to God. I wouldn't let the enemy have any, any place because I knew if I didn't keep giving it to God, I was going to lose out in, in everything in my life. And it wasn't worth a piece of gold. All right? I really want you to, we're going to be here to hear more about forgiveness. But at tonight, I really want you to think about this. Can you be just like Jesus? And when he hung on that cross, looking down at all of his torturers, standing around him, mocking him and ridiculing him, could you really say, Father, forgive them? For they know not what they do. This is where this is where it's at tonight. Can you really say that? When I was first born again and I found out about what Jesus did, when people hurt me, I would go and I would say, Father, forgive them, for they really don't know what they're doing. And then I would say this about one person who kept hurting me over and over and over again. And finally God said, Don't ever bring that prayer to me ever again. That person knows exactly what they're doing. They calculate every second out. They know exactly how they're going to talk to you. They know exactly what they're going to do to you. Don't be and don't ever bring that prayer to me again because they do know no. They do know what they're doing. And unless God brings that to you, then you have to keep praying for them. God forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Sometimes I'll say to my kids in my house, and they want to get smart with me. Boy, you better watch out because I'm the apple of God's eye and you just got in a whole lot of trouble. You just stuck your finger in God's and he's going to get you. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Where are you at? Can you sit there in your seat tonight and actually say, Father, I want you to forgive those who've come against me, who have despitefully used me, who have ridiculed me, lied about me, mocked me, said all manner of evil about me. Can you really sit there in your seat tonight and honestly say, I don't want to carry this grudge any longer. I don't want this contamination in my heart. I want to be totally and completely set free right now. If you really said that prayer and you really mean it, the altar is open because God really wants to set you free from all that that stuff that's in there that's contaminating not only your heart but the hearts of the people around about you. The altar is open. 